Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, presentation on units, dates, and uncertainty. My name is Nick Larivier, and I'm a kernel developer here at Wolfram Research, and I work on a number of different frameworks for the kernel, but uh, in particular on our unit and date frameworks. And today we're going to be going over some new features and enhancements we've made in version 12, continuing to update and improve our unit and date framework and adding a new framework for the handling of uncertainty in the Wolfram language. Since we have a number of different topics here, we've tried to organize things um, based on general area of functionality. So we have, we'll be going over some examples that have to do with our handling of quantity variable in the Wolfram language and some new functions for handling different aspects of physical systems. We'll be talking some about uh, new constructs we have for handling large sets of dimensional data and functions that operate on those. We'll also look at some of the new ways that we have in the language of handling physical constants and the uncertainty associated with those. And then we'll try and dive a little deeper into the different aspects of uncertainty and precision and how those two relate and how they're different uh, and look specifically at the construct of around and some related functions that we've added recently. And also in, in the same field, we also want to talk a little bit about some of the enhancements we've made to our date framework, in particular date objects and the way we handle granularity, which is a new notion for uh, version 12, and the way that it interrelates with our other data frameworks, such as the Wolfram Knowledge Base. So to start out, I want to take a look at a couple of different aspects of the date framework and what we've done for version 12 to enhance that. So we have a number of examples here that go over some different features of the date framework, how it interacts with the Wolfram knowledge base, how we can use new utility functions to filter it down, and uh, also the way we interact with, with some time zone features and some historical data and the way that granular dates come into play there. But I wanted to start by drilling down a little bit into how the Wolfram knowledge base interacts with our date framework. So if you aren't familiar with the function entity value, it is our general knowledge base function, which includes a large number of dorm domains. Uh, that cover a variety of topics from geographic areas to special aspects of math or physics or social data, a bunch of different aspects that are in some ways collated into computable elements or specific elements we may be interested in looking at. And a common element that comes up in a lot of those is the handling of dates. So for example, we may have something like a famous person that we want to look up. Uh, and we may be able to look up something such as their birth date. And that information for various different people is going to have a different granularity associated with it. So in version 12, date object now has a granularity. So in this case, we can see if we're looking at a historical figure such as Cleopatra, where we don't have a lot of certainty about the exact day in which they're born, we can represent that relative lack of uh, the lack of a, a specific date or day associated with that by using a granular day or a granular year in this case. Whereas if we looked at someone more recent, um, we could look at their birth date in the same way and we have a specific day associated with that. We don't necessarily care about the resolution of the exact instant they were born or the exact minute. Most data that is curated about dates has a different granularity associated with it and we try and reflect that in the language. So one of the interesting things we can do with the knowledge base is that we can take a large collection of data and filter that information down using dates. So for example, if I were to pull down our entire list of movies that have Angelina Jolie included in them, it's a pretty long list. We 
end up with about 40 different oh, lengths. We have 40 different movies in our database. And one of the key properties for a movie is the release date associated with it. So just keep track of these here. And a nice feature of date objects is that I can feed them into our sorting function. So I can say sort of yesterday, tomorrow, yesterday, tomorrow, and today. And our sorting function will know how to appropriately reorder those so that they're in a canonical form. So we can take advantage of this by feeding either sorting functions or uh, different ordering functions to say, I have this collection of movies and I want to say, okay, I would like to sort them by the release date and give me just the 10 most recent ones. So take largest by as default ordering, we'll be using that canonical sorting function. And in this case, we only want the 10 most recent ones. We can then gather additional information about those by taking that same list and we can look at, we can actually look at what those release dates are directly or alternatively because the knowledge base system includes support for queries directly inside of an entity class, we can make a new entity class that says, we want any movie that contains Angelina Jolie. And rather than giving us all of the movies, we want to use that same functionality that exists and take largest and just say, give me the 10 latest ones. So this gives us a class directly that we can then query using the same entity value function and say, I want the movie poster image or release date and it's domestic box office gross value all returned as a data set. And without having to do that filtering locally, we can actually do a direct transaction with the knowledge base server and have it apply that same filtering criteria down for us. So we can take that same principle of working with the dates associated with a entity value domain. In this case, I'm gonna look at artwork which works on a different time scale and say, I want to figure out different ways of filtering down elements related to that date. So in this case, we'll say, okay, we have this, the night watch, which is one of Rembrandt's paintings. And we can say, well, that was completed in 1642. Was that within the 1600s? Date within Q is a function which gives us the ability to test the different aspects of granularity associated with dates. So I can say, does now fall within the bounds of today? It does, but the inverse is not true. Yesterday, now did not fall at any point during yesterday. Today happens within a particular decade, et cetera. And we can use this aspect of date filtering to select down different elements. So if we want to look, for example, at all the different works that have been completed by Rembrandt, we get 56 different works of art that are in the knowledge base. Now I could take all of that information and throw it straight into a timeline plot to get a nice visualization of Rembrandt's work throughout his lifetime. But that happens to be kind of a cluttered bit right here. There's a lot of art that's being produced during specific periods. So rather than going back directly to the server and asking for that information again to try and select things down, we can use date within Q to say, okay, taking all of those dates that I've already, all of that artwork that I've already accumulated, we can say, okay, I want to select only those that happened within the 1660s. And we have a much smaller list, which makes it easier to inspect the individual elements that are being used. And we can do the same sort of work with our timeline plot function to visualize those on a much 
shorter time scale. We can also, using that same data, then make it a slightly more interesting visual form of it by taking the image of each of those paintings and using it instead of the name element. So we get a nice graph of Rembrandt's work during the 1660s, each represented by the individual painting itself. There's a lot of extra functionality that's been added in with dates dealing with granularity. So in addition to date within Q, we also have the notion of date overlaps Q, which because dates of differing granularity may intersect in different ways, it may be interesting to know whether two dates are not necessarily entirely, or one date is not necessarily entirely contained within another, but that it happens to intersect at some point. So I wanna jump back here and there's extra information on this page about working with granular dates, specifically in historical uh, domains and also some additional information about the extra information we've curated about time zones. Uh, but I wanna cover some of the other topics we're looking at today. So I'm going to loop back here towards the beginning of this page and talk a little bit about how we handle quantity and quantity variable and our different representations of dimensional data in the Wolfram language. Uh, so if you're not familiar, quantity is our representation of a dimensional uh, in a dimensional value with associated with a physical unit. So our representation of three inches in the language is quantity three inches. Uh, this is a construct we added into the language in version nine, and we've been expanding and improving its integration and performance throughout the system uh, ever since. A related but slightly different element associated or different construct associated with uh, dimensional data is that of quantity variable. So if quantity three inches is a specific measure of length, quantity variable of L length is the general notion of a physical quantity of length. Both of these, if we were to look at the dimensions associated with them, we would see they both represent length, but the difference being that the quantity variable doesn't have any value directly associated with it. And a quantity variable also has many different instances that may make up the same uh, physical dimension. So for example, in quantity variable, we consider width to be distinct from length. Even though both have a physical dimension of length unit, there's, there are many cases where the dimensional data being specifically of length or depth or height uh, is of interest and that's information that quantity necess can't necessarily carry around on its own. So a common use for quantity variable is to uh, be used in formulas. And along with quantity variable in version 10, we introduced formula data, which can be used to get back specific formulas that relate to dimensional equations. So in this case, a simple formula for the area of a rectangle is that the area is equal to the length times the width. One of the things that we've added in version 12 is a function that's specifically designed for improving the ease at which we can manipulate dimensional equations by non-dimensionalizing them. So that is factoring out the dimensional aspects of the equation so that we can use simpler variables to represent a, a more complicated instance of that physical system. So in this case, I'll define a pretty simple equation, which is that our length is equal to some length value plus a value of acceleration times time squared plus a time value plus a velocity. So in each case, each of the terms is a length, but there are different dimensional elements associated with each of them. We can use the non-dimensionalization transform function to effectively remove out some of the complexity based on the different dimensions associated with each of these. So we have the same equation, but our terms have changed to be that we have some constant value 
divided by our length unit plus some numeric value. And then we have our, uh, our time value times our uh, velocity with a measure of length divided by length, uh, et cetera. So this is one way of recharacterizing the same expression by factoring out a lot of the dimensional elements and using specific constants that we define. So that's a slightly simpler example. If we want to look at a more complicated example, we can take something such as the uh, formula for the surface gravity of a charged black hole. So in this case, we can use formula data to look up that same information and we get a much more complicated expression with more terms that we need to worry about. But the nice thing about having this non-dimensional transformation available is that we can extract from formula data the dimensional variables associated with that equation and then simply feed those back in with new placeholder variables to factor out the dimensional aspects associated with that formula. Now, this is still kind of a complicated instance of this formula because of the different physical constants that are used uh, in representing the surface gravity of the black hole. So we can further simplify the expression by saying that we're going to work with a de Sitter unit system, which will remove some of these more complicated unit expressions of seconds to the electron to the six times elect ah, times the electric constant times speed of light, et cetera, down to simple values of cosmological constant, which makes this a much more approachable formula. And then non-dimensionalization transform has a number of different lookup properties that are available. So for example, if we're interested in understanding how we go from the initial formula into this non-dimensionalized non -dimensionalized form, we can provide the same value, but say we want to know what the non-dimensionalization rules are. So in this case, this would be the transformation of mass into its symbolic form. So how we factor those dimensional values into their non-dimensional forms. Uh, the example here goes into a little more detail if you're interested in how we can factor those specific elements out and look at, for example, you know, we can take that same set of rules and then reduce down and see what our mass replacement ends up looking like in terms of solar masses instead of values of the speed of light squared divided by gravitational constant and cosmological constant. So I will jump back here. Uh, another aspect that we've been improving since the initial introduction of dimensional data in the Wolfram language is the representation of large sets of dimensional data. So uh, a construct we added back in version 10 is that of quantity array, which lets us represent a large list of or a large array of values associated with a single or potentially multiple pairs of units. So I can say I have a range of 20 values and they're all represented as meters. I can get a single container back, which is which represents that vector of 20 values. It gives me information like the minimum and maximum, but I can also normalize that form into a vector of quantities instead. And there are a number of useful functions. Uh, in this case, we can see that geomagnetic model data, we can specify a large region, in this case, the region covering the entire surface of the globe, and we can get back the geomagnetic model data associated with the entire globe. And we can visualize that directly with different functions uh, because we use quantity array and it's operate, it operates using the same array framework as other elements of the Wolfram language. We're able to work directly in functions like matrix plot uh, without having to do a whole lot of work. The units are naturally understood and the values are scaled appropriately. 
another new addition that we've made in version 12 is the way that we handle vectors of uh, dimensional data. So we can not only represent values that are happen or we can not only represent the way that the geomagnetic model data exists as specific values, but we can also look at the geo vector flow associated with that. So in this case, we'll be looking up the geomagnetic model data for what the for the Arctic Ocean, and we can also take that information directly and put it into visualization functions such as uh, geostream plot because we have a direction associated with the magnetic field data. We can actually pull that information together and show the way that the gravitational field is pulling and also in this case add in additional labels for things like the dip hole and the uh, north pole and magnetic north. So we can see the way that the field interacts with each of those different poles. Uh, there is more information here also looking at some of the new functions we have for dealing with uh, humidity and the interaction of different physical systems with specific parameters. So this is a nice example of looking at the way that a humidifier works in, or a dehumidifier works in a room with moist air. There's another example here looking at the way that we've extended our, our knowledge base to include information about tides and the way that those synchronize with different lunar phases. Uh, I won't spend too much more time on that here because I want to look at some of the improvements we've made around physical constants and how they're used in the Wolfram language. So we've had, since the introduction of quantity, we've had the notion of physical constants existing inside the unit framework. So for exa example, we can have a quantity that represents the speed of light. So this is one times the speed of light or if we don't want the, the prefix there, we can use this none magnitude. And we can handle that within the unit framework and get its fundamental value back out. We can convert it to miles per hour, et cetera. But one of the complicated things with physical constants is that they don't behave in exactly the same way that units do um, because many of their values are observed, there are different characteristic dimensions associated with them. And so we've extended for version 12, the Wolfram language to include additional data about physical constants. So in this case, I'm gonna look at a subset of these, which is those physical constants which have SI exact values or new SI exact values, because as some of you may know, on May 20th, the def unit definitions used by uh, the SI unit system were changed such that they will be based specifically on physical constants rather than on their, historic, their historical uh, predecessors. So you may know that a meter is defined as the length of a specific object that exists in a vault somewhere but there are problems with the way that that material decays. It doesn't decay very quickly, but the length of the meter actually changes slightly over time. And using these physical objects to represent the fundamental definition of the way that we measure everything in the universe turns out to have a lot of problems with it. And so the new SI unit definitions were put in place on May 20th of this year to partially solve that problem by giving tying essentially the fundamental definitions of these units to observable physical constants a a element that changes with that is that because we base the value of those physical cons or those fundamental unit values on physical constants a lot of those physical constants may be things that we're measuring and they have some uncertainty associated with them so if I look, for example, right now at Boltzmann's constant and I look at its fundamental unit value, we get 
a measure that has some finite precision associated with it. So if I look at the magnitude value of it and I ask for the precision, we're looking at a machine precision number that only has so many digits known. Effectively, we're measuring the value of Boltzmann's constant and we don't know exactly what its fundamental value is. The same information is reflected when we look at the knowledge base representation of this. We can see what its value is currently so many joules per Kelvin, and it has a standard uncertainty associated with that measure. But with the updates to the SI unit definitions, they will actually be, Boltzmann's constant will be defined as an exact rational value. And we can see within the representation, we can look at, for example, a data set of all the data we have available about Boltzmann's constant. And one of the elided elements here, because it's a little long, is the value association, or effectively the change in Boltzmann's constant value over time using different standards. And if we look at the uh, CODA 2017 recommendation, the new value that will be associated with Boltzmann's constant is this exact, if rather large, rational value of joules per Kelvin. We'll, we'll effectively know with exact uh, precision what the value of Boltzmann's constant is because of the change in the definition of the fundamental SI unit values. Uh, this is kind of a deep and complicated topic. Uh, our own Wolfram Research, uh, Wolfram Research's own Michael Trott has written up a number of good uh, blog entries that detail in a lot more specific elements exactly how all of this came about, the rationale behind it, um, and we'll provide some links at the, the end of the presentation here if you want to get more information, for example, on how the, the new SI standard change, which will be getting reflected in, in Wolfram language soon as part of version 12, um, will be rolled out and what implication that has for working with these constants and different formulas. Um, so that's, again, sort of a, a brief overview of some of the changes we've made in version 12 related to units and dates and physical constants and this sort of notion of dimensional data and the way we represent it in the language and collect it. Um, but one new area that we want to take a little bit more detailed look at is the way that we represent uncertainty in data uh, with our new construct of around. So I'm going to stop here for a moment and let Jose talk for a little bit about uh, that new area of functionality. Thank you, Nick. So my name is Jose Martin Garcia, and I I'm going to be presenting the uh, new construction around that we will be using from now on to describe uncertain numbers. In the future, we will uh, be able to handle other uncertain objects like dates, but for the moment, we handle uncertain numbers and quantities. So there is a row of examples here, and uh, each one shows a different aspect of the of a round. So in the first example, it presents the object itself and how it can be used in uh, visualization functions. Then we will see uh, how to propagate uncertainties through computations. The third example explores the issue of correlation and the importance of keeping correlations while doing computations. And the final example shows the um, how to compute means of um, averages of uh, objects with uncertainty. So let's start with this first example. Um, let me introduce first uh, a round. So let's take this object. Okay, here. So this object around um, represents a number whose uh, value is uncertain, but we know it's distributed statistically 
um, following a normal distribution with mean this number and with the standard deviation this number. Notice first how it's typeset. Of course, if we know that this is the uncertainty, following standard traditions, we typically only keep one or two digits. So for example, in this case, we will round uh, to 26 and keep only two digits. If the number, if the rounded digits were above 35, then we would keep only one. You will see examples in, in the following. So once we have selected the number of digits that we want to keep in the uncertainty, we keep the same number of digits uh, after the decimal comma in the value itself. Of course, the number is still fully there. Okay, so what can we do with a num with an around object? For example, we can do computations, like we can take a square and you see how errors are automatically computed, or we can compute the square root. And now you see because the, di the rounded digits are above 35, we keep only one of them. Again, all the numbers are still there. And you see how, because these two are larger than 35, we round it up. So, okay, um, as I said, we can handle also quantities. So for example, we can take that number and we can say, well, let's take a quantity whose magnitude is uncertainty, is uncertain and it has uh, units of meters. So we get that object. Again, we can do computations with it and errors will be propagated. We can have also um, an around object in which the, um, the value is a quantity, say a quantity of two kilometers. And then the error is say, a quantity of I don't know, 13 centimeters or centimeters. You see that because we are dealing with uncertainties of meters, this value develops digits up to digits as to up to meters as well. As soon as we do computations, we will transform into a common unit. Okay. And the third thing I wanted to introduce at the beginning is the following. So imagine that we have this around object again. So now if we take twice that value, it means that we will be having a value which is la twice larger, and of course, the error will also be twice larger. So we get exactly uh, double of numbers. However, if we started from that object plus that object itself, now the result is slightly different. The error is smaller. That's because these two around objects are considered now independent. In this case, if we were dealing with an object of true value, say 3.8, then the error will be positive of a given amount and twice that error will be twice the error. However, in this case, this object may have a value, a true value of 3.8 and this one could have a value of 3.7. So the errors would be um, one positive or negative, they will be compensating and so, um, on average, the error of this resulting object will be smaller than the error of this object. And in fact, the origin of this number here is just this error. Instead of being multiplied by two, it's multiplied by square root of two. So all these computations are done automatically uh, for us. Okay, so that's a uh, small intro to um, run. And now let's look at the uh, examples. So let's talk about it. So for example, um, here we have um, data, which is coming from um, the Fall From Knowledge base, base about exoplanets. And so we will be asking for two properties. One will be mass, the other radius. And we ask those properties to come as um, 
Uh, sorry. Not here. Here. Yeah. So here we see the um, property being uh, asked with uncertainty as an around object. There are other ways of asking for uncertainty values as intervals, as numbers with a given precision, etc. But here we get uh, the values with uh, around objects. So for example, this, uh, the result is um, an association. And here we have some of the values. Um, uh, yes, so here we see also uh, errors being reported with um, asymmetric um, form. So for example, we could have three and error of um, that to the left or that to the right. right? And we get this standard notation. So that's what's happening here. Once we have a collection of 457 uh, values, we can represent and the, um, the visualization functions are prepared to interpret the around objects and draw the corresponding uh, errors as crosses. There are other ways in which they can be represented, like with ellipses, uh, etc. But by default, we get these crosses. And um, because the data comes as an association, we can also provide the uh, association itself to list plot, and it will try to put as many of the uh, labels, avoid them if possible, uh, collisions among them. So as I said, this is just an example to show that the visualization functions can handle uh, around objects. Now let's go to um, an example on how to do error propagation. So here we will follow an example in the guide to the expression of um, uncertainty in measurement. This is a document uh, that um, explains how to do properly error propagation in statistical measurements. And um, yes, so we will be following example H1. And uh, the example, we don't have to get into the details of it, but basically it takes this formula and providing values for uh, some of the objects involved here. The question is, what's the final uncertainty on the final object? L. So we will provide those uh, values in, as rules. We will say, for example, for LS, we have a round with a quantity of this uh, size and the uncertainty is 25 nanometers. For another object, alpha s, this one, we will have that value, etc. etc. So again, let's um, copy these rules. So we have that rule for ls. So we have that one for alpha s. We have this one for beta alpha. Have this one for theta s, and finally we have this one for delta theta. Let's see if there's another one. Yes, there's one more. Have those values. So I have a copy here of the. We, we can see here these are the values provide uh, the errors provided. For example, this 25 nanometers is this one, or this 0 0.41. It's here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the final thing is, how do we get the uh, uh, error of this formula? Well, we use the function around replace, and here we get the value. Um, we need to use this function around replace because precisely we need to keep correlations, as we were saying before. For example, this LS and LS need to be treated as the same object. If we were placing here directly the run object and here the run object, they will be treated as two different 
independent and certain values and the computation would be wrong. So we can go here and um, let me see. Yeah. We go to the section final result and we see how um, we get exactly the value that they report. So this is a value and this is a notation to say that uh, these digits are the ones having uh, uncertainty 32. With, the, with this object we can then for example unit convert to meters or millimeters for example and we get uh, an alternative way of presenting the same result. Okay let's go now to th third example. So in this one we will be dealing with correlations and imagine that we are given this table of data of pairs and which are plotted like this. So we see that there is a clear increasing behavior in the formula, in, in, sorry, in the data. So we can use linear model fit to find a fit, linear fit to these values. And then we get that this is the result. Um, we can ask for what are the values of A and B, this ones here. And we can ask for what are the uncertainties obtained in the values A and B. So now imagine that we wanted to say, okay, if we now want to extrapolate this formula to the value 10, how would we do it? Well, we can go and say, yes, let's take the, the um, around objects with their uncertainties and just say 10. Well, the problem is that because these data are coming from uh, the same set of, of pairs, the, the results A and B are actually correlated. So what we need to do is to compute the covariance or correlation metrics. They, they contain the same information, they are related by this formula. And the proper way to do this computation is actually using this formula, which is again an around replace like here. But now we will describe both A the coefficients a and b simultaneously using a vector around objects that contains the values and the covariance metrics. So the covariance metrics is a two by two matrix that contains the uncertainties here, squares, these two numbers squared are the, the, the diagonals. And then the important thing is that it also contains this other number that describes the correlation between a and b. And when we do that, we get the same value, but with smaller the correct uh, uncertainty. And finally, the the third, uh, the fourth example I want to show um, deals with averages. So let's go here and work with uh, round, and we start with this table of data. This is a table of data. Um, which is um, listing for given for different dates the values measured or estimated for the Hubble constant. So we have um, so, uh, we have dates and the values without units in this case of the Hubble constant. So now the question is: Well, if we have this collection of values representing the same object, the same in, in, um, unknown value of the Howard constant, how would we find the best value out of this? Well, if we take first, uh, let's take the values as Hubble uh, or two. So those are the values we have. We can first just simply do this. And this is just saying that the uh, average of all these values is 71. And if we try to describe them with a uh, normal distribution, the normal distribution would have um, standard deviations of 2.8. However, we can do better than that. And we can ask for the value of the mean 
and the ascending of the mean. And when we do this, because these values have their own errors, this function is also going to take these errors into account. This one didn't. And so this function will penalize those values here with larger errors, like the uh, older ones. And it will, so it will give a result which is closer to uh, values with small, smaller errors. Okay. And we get that value. Not, notice how much smaller this value is. Um, and so this is, again, the value of the mean and the uncertainty of the mean, right? While this was the value, uh, um, the mean of all these values and the uncertainty of the whole distribution, not just the uncertainty of the mean. Okay, so that, yeah, so here we have a representation with respect to time. And here we see these values that we were describing here. Okay, um, so that's all I had prepared to describe uh, in relation to uncertainty. And well, uh, Nick, I think uh, that's all we have prepared. Is there anything yeah. else you wanted to say? Um, I think that pretty much covers it for the time being. Um, if anyone has any questions about the material we went over or related topics, we're happy to take the another 12 minutes or so that we have to discuss those or you've got a captive audience of developers so feel free to to pester us if you have any burning questions and we'll do our best to answer them um We'll wait around for a couple minutes in case anyone is trying to type anything out. Um, otherwise, it's been nice having you all here. I know we covered a variety of different topics, but uh, they all sort of fall under the umbrella of ways that we describe more complicated data in that exists in the real world and the way that it gets reflected in uh, expressive languages like the Wolfram language are are an interesting challenge of the way that we represent, you know, the uncertainty associated with measures, the different ways that different physical attributes interact with measured values and how dates fall into that are all uh, sort of a common aspect of these different areas of functionality. Okay. Um, well, it looks like we don't have any burning questions right now. If you, think of any after the fact, feel free to pass those along um, to either our support group, at the technical support group at Wolfram Research, or uh, you can get a hold of us through the either any of the social media links associated with this stream. Uh, so thank you all for your time and enjoy the rest of your day.